Well, a very warm welcome to you then. We were sure that um, Iran, so shortly after Iranian elections would draw a bit of an audience, so very well, a warm welcome to you. And also to those who follow us on live stream. This is a session where we talk about the impact on the Iranian elections. My name is Ilke Tempere. I'm with the German Council on Foreign Relations and I have the great pleasure to um, introduce um, this panel to you with Professor Mohamed Reza Farzanigan, who is with the Philipp A. University in Marburg and the Center of Economics at the, the head of the Center of Economics of the Near and Middle East um, there. And we have Daniel Gerlach, who is editor-in-chief of the magazine Zenit, founder also, who is founder of Candid Foundation and who is a frequent analyst of um, Near and Middle East issues also on German and international media. Let me start with you, Professor Fazanigan. Ye yesterday, we could see that um, almost at the moment when the Inter Ministry of Interior had published the first results of the Iranian elections, and it turned out that, prof that um, Mr. Rouhani, President Rouhani, would do a second term, um, High Representative Frederica Mogherini had tweeted it already, and then also said in one of the panels, also in one of the panels yesterday, that she seems to be pretty happy because that means that we probably have the Iran nuclear deal intact. But apart from that, what, what would you say uh, is the major impact of this election and President Rouhani serving a second term, mainly on foreign policy issues and mainly because we're here in Jordan? That's, of course, a very important question on the region. Well, yes, thank you. Uh, I guess uh, the message of this election and the results that we observe by participation of more than 70% seven, uh, 70 of the, those who are eligible uh, to vote uh, was very much clearer. Uh, the middle class in urban areas, the major cities and major areas uh, were very much uh, signaling the support for uh, continuation of the government of Rouhani, which were promising more political stability and the economic reform, uh, despite the fact that the other candidates uh, coming from the conservative parts uh, were promising um, uh, distribution of or increasing of subsidies, uh, cash payments, especially uh, Mr. Raisi or Qalibov, who later on uh, did uh, resign and uh, give the space to Mr. Raisi as a support. Both of them were promising to increase the cash payment, direct cash payments to the people if they get elected. Uh, so the message and the majority of the people who voted for Rouhani was against his populist spending. Oh, so this as in almost every uh, election, also in Iran, this was mainly about national, local issues. It was pretty much about the economy, apart from one thing, and that mm -hmm. is economic reform, because this is so greatly tied to the sanctions regime and getting rid of the sanction regime. So do I gather it correctly that voting for Rouhani, Daniel Gerlach, was pretty much also voting for how can we proceed with getting rid of the sanction regime so that we can open up, really? Yeah, it would be. But the problem is um, many Iranians um, haven't, or most Iranians probably haven't felt the positive impact of the so-called nuclear deal yet. Um, and that's been the main argument of uh, Hassan Rani's uh, challenger, uh, Ibrahim Raisi, that he said, you do not care about uh, the plight of the majority of Iranians who are suffering uh, economically. I think it was, it was a real, um, the, the reason why Rouhani won was not because he, his e economic policy was successful. It was because people knew him better and because the contender, Raisi, was not known to them and was not sympathetic to them. I think, um, Rouhani was he he he, he could have been, been been beaten on economic terms even by another challenger because the economic uh, situation in Iran is not to the satisfaction of the majority of the Iranians at the moment and they also blame or many of them also blame uh, the international community the Americans uh, for their plight so I think I I take this with a grain of salt I don't think that people are happy because everything is going so well in Iran I think there's also a foreign, foreign policy factor to it which is that Iranians at the moment feel insecure by the situation in the Middle East, but they also see that Dohani is somebody who represents not only some, uh, a voice of reason and somebody who's reaching out, as he said, to, the, to, to other countries and wants to engage with, uh, in, 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 in free way with, uh, with the international community, but also as somebody who is pretty solid on security. Yeah. And he knows, he's a security, former security official, and he knows 
uh, security concerns and he takes it seriously. And I think that is one of the reasons why, why, why people trusted him for a second term. Let's stick with the foreign policy agenda then, Professor Fazanagan, because um, he's Rouhani and obviously people do care a lot about security and it's about the situation in the Middle East. Now, how much of a leverage does the president in Iran really have on foreign policy or is it rather the revolutionary <laughs> guards, the spiritual, the supreme leader who called the shots when it comes to foreign policy and that means shaping the region the way Iran in different ways will come to that is shaping mm -hmm. the region right now? I guess again the major supporters of Rouhani uh, who are educated middle class intellectuals uh, send a clear signal also to our neighborhood, neighbor countries including the Saudi Arabia because the major uh, part of the support that the Raisi and Ghalibov and the other candidates had uh, were also uh, maybe uh, classified, recognized as those who uh, had a more harsher approach to uh, maybe the Saudi Arabia uh, diplomacy. So uh, the point is, uh, that was also the critical point that uh, um, uh, Rouhani were, uh, were mentioning that the major supporter of the uh, uh, Mr. Raisi and Ghalibov indeed uh, will bring Iran to the earlier stage like the, during the Ahmadinejad increasing the tension. So these uh, words which the people gave to the Rouhani signalized the willingness of the average citizen in Iran for <laughs> pacifying the situation, for stabilizing the situation. And for that reason, uh, I guess our neighbors uh, in Iran, uh, around us, uh, especially from the Arab world, uh, uh, will get also this measure from the civil society in Iran that the the future of Iran is looking for a more uh, stabilization of the region, a better relationship with the uh, Arab neighbors, and uh, I guess the president, uh, especially Mr. Rouhani, uh, will have a leverage on the, mm -hmm. the coordinating different interests within the system. Uh, he has been successful in bringing right and left together, uh, and uh, this success now, uh, with the majority support of the voters, has been amplified and will be amplified, and I'm very much optimistic that uh, the situation. Well, I'm not, I, uh, to be honest, I'm not so optimistic. Um, the big misunderstanding has always been that international diplomats and politicians thought, thought, yeah, we're dealing with Iran, we can negotiate with the Iranians, we are successful, uh, we can build uh, relationships of trust, but in fact, then the big frustration comes that they say, the people that we are dealing with, the, 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 the gentle face, let's say, of the government is not necessarily those that call the shots on security policy terms. And this is going to be the big challenge for the, for the government of Rouhani, mm -hmm. because um, I tend to compare the Iranian engagement in Syria, for example, as like somebody who is sending an A360 Airbus into the air without knowing if on the other side where he's actually sending the airplane, there is a runway to land this plane. And the Iranians have publicly admitted this, like reasonable diplomats have said, we have no real exit strategy. We have started this, we have been drawn into this conflict because we wanted to have some kind of a proactive security policy. We have no allies in the region, so we could not afford to lose Syria and Iraq, but they have no exit strategy to get out of the mess. And um, I think the real challenge for Rouhani is going to be somehow to pull the security-related foreign policy issues, namely uh, Syria and Iraq, out of the hands of the Revolutionary Guards. But Iran has a National Security Council. The, the, the Supreme Leader uh, selects also the members of the, of the Security Council, but there is the, the Revolutionary Guards are there. Yeah. And influential people, the President is one voice in the National Security Council, but um, he's not the one who is, as I said, calling the, the shots in this, in, this, in this council. And this is going to be the big challenge because the, the Revolutionary Guards have, 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 have different interests and a different view on foreign policy. Mm -hmm. And we see and the results. different stakes in foreign policy. Of course, of course. So the general situation, correct me if I'm wrong, would be that President Rouhani, on one hand, got a bit of a mandate by the civil society, of course, which longs for yeah, an end of isolation, better relations in the neighborhood, you know, a better security situation, a better economic situation. But he could, in a hybrid system like Iran, where there are so many conflicting interests also, he could face a situation where he's basically stopped short in this endeavor by the more conservative voices connected with the Revolutionary Guards, who basically say, well, you can show your really nice face and your, charming of, your charm offensive here and there, but actually, you know, um, we do have real tough interests in, in Syria. We are very much engaged. Plus, he would have to also justify that there are more and more 
uh, casualties in in Syria, which has an impact on on the Iranian yep. society. Yep. So how is he going to proceed on this? How is he going to sort out this Gordic knot? Well, the Revolutionary Guard, of course, uh, they are not only a military institution, but they are quite active also in domestic Iranian economy and international economy. That's probably Different an understatement. Big uh, <laughs> infrastructures and so on. For, for that reason, I guess uh, uh, they are also not that happy with the isolation of the Iranian economy. They were suffering from international sanction on the financial system of Iran because uh, for their own major project in oil industry they were needed this banking system, international banking connection and so on. Uh, and for sure they were, uh, maybe at the beginning they had this calculation that they get the larger size of Iranian domestic market if the total and shell leave the country, but uh, over the time, especially after the oil embargo of 2012 and the central banking sanctions into 2013, they realized also the pain uh, full part of uh, side of the sanctions. So uh, I guess they are also not promoting the isolation of Iranian economics and politics for their own benefit and interest is that Iran uh, become more integrated international markets, uh, especially for our Rouhani. The major challenge after the election is the very big uh, recession, given the fact that inflation rate uh, is under control, is reduced significantly from 40% in 2013, now under just below the 10%, but the cost was too high. The liquidity is uh, you know, collected mm -hmm. by the bank, so the use unemployment rate is increasing. Mm -hmm. So has increased by uh, 3% in a matter of three years, so 3 to 4%. So the major concern or the major winning card of the Raisi and Ghalibov against uh, Rouhani was this decision uh, and what he wants to do because mm -hmm. the four years in the power, so they didn't uh, neglect, uh, they neglect somehow the success the story of reduction of inflation, but the cost was recession. FDI is still very low during mm -hmm. the first office of Rouhani that's, foreign that's direct investment. Let's not in all the details of the Iranian economy because we need to get the big, big picture and I will ask you in a second about how we can help economically. But I, I point that the, my point that revolutionary guard, the role of revolutionary guard is a bit exaggerated, the negative image of revolutionary guard. Uh, they have a leverage, but their interests sometimes also uh, converge the interests yeah, look, of the look, Rouhani. Sorry, yeah. uh, look, um, at, the, at the nominations uh, of ambassadors to Syria and Iraq at the moment, both people are bred in the security guard environment, uh, the, uh, the uh, revolutionary guard environment. Both of them are let's say, uh, individuals very well connected to the leadership of the Revolutionary Guards, you can see that there is a, pri there is a priority in placing people with a security uh, um, IGRC background into, uh, into the, the other countries in the Middle East. And that also tells, I think, something about the, the policy and the attitude and the, the perspective uh, of Iran's foreign and security Which policy makes it on the hard region for at Rouhani the moment. To pursue his politics, but doesn't it? Exactly. But let's 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 look at the challenge of of, of, of Rouhani with respect uh, with regard to the international uh, environment. Many uh, Western analysts thought that Iranians would react to the election of President Trump by electing by voting for for a conservative mm -hmm. on their side. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, that's not the way it goes. Elections and uh, this is much more complex than that. But. Um, at the moment, it really feels like Rouhani is, is, is staging himself as the voice of reason. The day that, re that he gets reelected and that he claims we want to reach out to the world, we want to re re engage in dialogue and remain open uh, to, the, to other countries, President Trump is in, is in Saudi Arabia signing gazillion billion dollar weapons deals and, and uh, explicitly saying that his priority is the rollback of Iran in the region. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't mean by political and diplomatic terms alone. So Rouhani has to justify why he's still engaging with the West in that, in that context. But that, that shows also that this self-enactment self of being a voice of reason is somehow appealing to the international Absolutely. community. And uh, he got re-elected. Let me ask you one question. And you have to give a short answer, and it will be an advice before we go into the audience, because we have a lot of knowledgeable people here who I believe will have plenty of questions. Um, we've, I've, I've mentioned uh, High Representative Mogherini's um, optimism uh, after the election results came out. So what would you advise her to do to strengthen this politics of reason, as you call it, that seemed to make a few things easier keeping the nuclear deal, what would you advise her to do? Or what would you advise her for the Europeans to 
make this happen, to get Iran more out of the isolation, to be much more of a, a forthcoming partner, let's put it that way, in the regional context. Like one short, yeah, one short advice uh, you've got to do. Delivering the promises that they have given to Iran uh, following the Iran deal, because uh, Rouhani is in a difficult situation. Iran has uh, <laughs> implemented the whatever that they wanted from controlling the atom uh, program and all other standards and so on has complied. But uh, there are lots of difficulties still in giving the service, especially in the financial banking sanction uh, system, which uh, is a big concern. If we don't want that in the next four years, uh, a populist uh, person, mm -hmm. maybe Raisi, uh, come and all these uh, and you know accumulated experience collapse again. Yeah. Uh, I guess the ma uh, the major contribution of European yeah. international community in the United States is just to delivering those promises that they... We, we do know yeah. that it's connected um, to a power to the sanctions uh, by the Americans, which are connected to the human rights record, in, in, and the Europeans only have a limited leverage to get rid of those. And Daniel, and what's it, your advice? It, it's, not only, it's not only the Europeans or the Western world that needs to deliver, by the way. Uh, Mohammed Reza, the, I think the, uh, we, had, we don't have the time to, to formulate a serious policy recommendation here, but I think the Europeans should not be tricked by this narrative of politics of reason. Yeah, there's reason in it, but there's you also... It. Well, I said, I said he's trying to present okay. himself as, as the voice of reason. Uh, but um, on the other hand, you have to see there is negative impact and neg negative consequence of, of a proactive Iranian foreign policy in the region. But what I think is, is, is paramount is, to a certain extent, it's natural that Iran is engaging and is trying to influence the destiny of the region in its own interest, and I think and clash with other countries' interests, and that need to be that needs to be um, that needs to be. I don't want to use the term contained because that could be misunderstood, but that needs to be tackled. But a military rollback of Iran, as some people in, seem to intend it at the moment from the region, is going to end in a disaster. And I think taking seriously the security concerns of Iran in the region, but at the same time showing its limits. I think that is very important and mm -hmm. that is, it, it's, it's not easy to accomplish. Obviously. Your questions, ladies and gentlemen. If you would quickly introduce yourself, we start in the first, obviously we start in the first row, we go here and then we go to you. Do we have a microphone or can we do without a microphone? Then we have it yeah. right here with the gentleman in the first row. Quick introduction and a quick yeah. question. Pierre Chamoun, I represent a company called Tarket. We are a worldwide flooring producer. And I've been going to Iran since 1997 against the uh, orthodoxies of sanctions. We are doing very well there. Knowing Iran very well and <coughs> knowing the hardline position of the hierarchy in Iran, who is really working against what the population wants. And today, the majority of the population under 30, they voted for the status quo with the hope that the sanctions will move forward in a positive way. Do you think the hardliners can really keep stopping the new wave of revolution that could happen starting from the youth. Mm -hmm. The youth of today have got it really bad and they need a change. How can the hardline stop that? Thank yep. you. Shall I come in? Yes, please do. Okay. And you can give the, yeah. Microphone, but to answer answer, to answer yeah, your question for first. You mentioned, I mean, one way of uh, one consequence of this modernization in Iran has been expansion of middle class. Most of them, young population, youth, youth bulge that we know between 15, 24 years old. Uh, at the time of Ahmadinejad, it was 35 percent of the adult population, the youth bulge. Right now, in 2017, it's just reduced to 18 percent. And the prediction of the World Bank simulated that in 2015 it approached it to 10 percent. So uh, I guess uh, you know, also the studies in economics when it comes to how institutions affect the political stability, this youth bulge is quite important. The critical threshold, which uh, Samuel Huntington in his book in the Clash of Civilization also mentioned before all major revolution and political protests, he recognized these specific demographic characteristics. The youth bulge was beyond of 20%. So in future, this burden, this demographic burden will reduce in Iran. So we are not observing a significant uh, agents of the change in coming because of the demographic transition in Iran. So at least that, uh, that reduced the risk of political conflict in the forthcoming years, according to my view, but we not eliminate it, as we also recognize 
organize higher educational attainment in Iran, uh, uh, expanding middle class in Iran is not uh, really happy with social restrictions in different dimensions. So they are challenging that. Fortunately, Iran is not an autocratic regime. It's a combination of different uh, uh, elements from democracy to less dem uh, democratic system. Uh, and the, the population... Less democratic is a nice, nice yes. way to put it. <laughs> and, the, and the people still, as you already recognize, 70%, 80% of people participate in elections, sometimes in parliamentary elections, and so they, yeah. they reflect their views. You know, so to, still put, there are some to put it in one line, the rich kids driving around on, on Tehran streets with expensive cars and bragging around are now the children of what you call the hardliners, not anymore the ones of the old bourgeoisie. And that is, that also, like, of course, corruption it plays a role, but this image tells a lot about the demographic, economic, and probably the political and ideological And, and just a change. quick reminder, there was a lot of talk about the youth bulge and the young generation wanting change under Khatami's um, presidency, and that was when he was elected into office, surprisingly, as Iran offers so many surprises, in the late 90s. Now, Khatami has been isolated politically totally. I don't think that you even can show his pictures these days or photos. Mm. And we are talking again about the youth, and actually the conservatives, remember 2009, have been really good in crashing, in crashing this. So we go to you, please, ask a question. Thank you. Good morning, my name is Nero Sklon. I'm from Statoil. Uh, I have a question. Has Rouhani come out of this election stronger than he did in his first election? And what does that really mean? Is he able to introduce more efficiently his new policies? And what is the uh, Rafsanjani effect that Rafsanjani is not there now to support him? Mm -hmm. Just before going this, to answer this, quick look at my watch. If you have more questions, this will be your chance now. If not, the panelists will answer it. Daniel, mm -hmm. will you start? <laughs> Very difficult. Did he come out of this stronger than, than out of the last elections? I think he did, yeah. I think he did. And um, the people, I think it's even good that he could do this without the support of Rasamjani. There was, there was a, like, a gamble. Would the loss of Rasamjani harm his uh, turnout in the election or would it be to his benefit? I think. T taking into account the harsh criti the criticism that was also uttered by the conservatives and by the political opponents of Rouhani, directed against Rafsanjani, explicitly directed against Rafsanjani, could have, he could have, Rafsanjani could have been also a liability in, in particular in economic policy terms. The big challenge is going to be not only who, who is going to be the next president of Iran after Rouhani, but, but, but who is going to be the next supreme leader. That's where that's the third rail of Iranian politics. That's where the power lies, and this is, of course, the debate that you do not find in in public, and that yeah. people try to avoid. But that means that doesn't mean that they uh, don't make up their minds about what they think the future is going to be. Can I perhaps uh, turn the question around and g give it to you? Um, has has the election results have they weakened the chances for Raisi, who has obviously had hopes to become? Um, uh, the successor of Ali Khamenei, um, have they weakened his chances to become um, the successor to Ali Khamenei? He never had a chance. <laughs> he never had a chance? No. Well, what do you think? Well, it shows that uh, <laughs> he's not the first option, at least within the civil society. To what extent this is an important criteria to uh, be elected or to be nominated, uh, appointed as a supreme leader is not quite clear because there are other characteristics uh, necessarily uh, is required, is demanded for being as a supreme leader, not necessarily mm -hmm. the public, uh, major public support. Um, so um, I am not uh, very uh, pessimistic that he is not later on um, uh, nominated for one option mm -hmm. for supreme leader. Uh, so it's still open. Um, uh, there's no guarantee. That and as always in Iran, open for surprises. Um, you know, candidates we thought had a chance turn out not to have ever had a chance, and so on. But what we'll see is definitely an attempt by a president who's been elected into office to sort of strengthen the voter base that has put him into this office. He, we, will keep, we will see him keep him struggling with the more conservative parts who call the shots when it comes to foreign policy. And this election result, sorry to jump in here, not only proves the, the resilience and the amazing talent for political survival of Rouhani, but of Khamenei. Because yeah. 
the way he presented himself as a proud supporter of this of this uh, election, the pictures he called on everybody. He said every single vote counts. Well, let's remember that in 2009, he bound his political destiny to a candidate called Ahmadinejad, which was probably the worst mistake in his political career. Yeah, but career. he survived that. And he survived. Yeah. And he is not challenged and questioned. And but we, what we will also see, just to sort of sum this up, is definitely also an Iran, be it under Rouhani in a different way, um, that is pursuing its interests in the region and that will put some of the partners um, also still into or we'll put a challenge to some of the partners also in the region. We're reaching the end here, so we have to stop this. I know we could have gone on to talk about Iran because it's such an interesting topic and such a diverse um, political landscape. I thank you for your questions and for coming here, and I thank, of course, the panelists for giving us um, their insights. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.